Welcome back to Audio Basics. And in this episode number two, I figured we would go ahead and talk about microphones. If you're talking about becoming a filmmaker, usually people say, well, let's talk about cameras. Just like when you're talking about recording sound, people are going to say, well, let's talk about microphones. I figure we would go ahead and tackle that one nice and early in the Audio Basics series. That way we have an understanding that the microphone is basically an extension of you. It is an electronic representation of what your ear does. Now, remember how in the previous episode, we talked about how the mids and highs in your voice travel a straight line uh, uh, without going more omnidirectional like the lower frequencies do. It travels a farther distance in more of a straight line. And if I were to turn around and face the opposite direction, my voice will sound very much different because the mids and highs are being directed away from you while the low end sounds are being picked up by your ear. Well, the microphone picks up things the same kind of way. And that's one thing to keep in mind with regards to a microphone is finding that good balance between where it's too close and doesn't sound natural because it has too much low end, too much proximity effect. And if you're not familiar with that term, proximity effect is the overabundance of bass that happens when you get too close to a microphone. Just like if I were to whisper in your ear, my voice would sound much more bassy because remember, the closer you are to me, my voice is going to be pushing more of that low end frequency in all directions, but it's going to travel outwards less then the mids and highs will. So if you're very, very close, the low end frequencies are going to be very present because you're very close to the source, the mouth that's, you know, putting them out there. And a microphone picks up the very much the same exact way. If you put a microphone very close to your mouth, it is picking up that low end energy much stronger than the mids and highs. Now, what does the picking up of the mids and highs and low end sounds? It's a part of the microphone called the diaphragm. Now, typically, you would compare the diaphragm of a microphone to the tympanic membrane inside your ear, which is the first thing that sound will encounter when it goes into your ear. It's kind of like, I guess you could almost say it's kind of like a balloon where vibrations hits it and then it goes through and hits the hammer, the anvil, stirrup. I'm sure you've heard of those before. And then it's therefore going back deeper into your ear where it's converted into an electrical impulse that your brain can respond to. In a very similar way, a microphone will convert sound into electrical energy. Now, I'm not going to get overly deep into the whole how a microphone does that because this is more basics, but I'm going to give you some analogies to kind of keep in mind with regards to how a microphone works. I'm going to go over the three main kinds of microphones that you're most likely going to be encountering, not like lav mics and PZO, BLM, that kind of thing, boundary layer mics. I'm not going to be going into those. I'm going to be talking about the dynamic the condenser and the ribbon microphone. Now, the best way for me to simplify them would be for me to say that a dynamic microphone is more like if you were to take a bowl, stretch a balloon over the surface of it, any vibrations that hit that balloon, the diaphragm, are going to create a very low electrical voltage output. That little bitty, a bit of electrical voltage needs to be amplified by a preamplifier or by an amp in order to be used for your recording. But that's a very low output of voltage. It's very, very low. That's one of the reasons why a dynamic microphone is considered to be less sensitive than other kinds, like a condenser, where we're going next. A condenser, I guess you could say, is very simple in the simplest possible terms would be like having a plate and then you put a balloon stretched across that and you also put 48 volts electric power through it which is the 48 volts phantom power that you hear about and then as vibrations hit that balloon it changes the way that the voltage is without getting too technical let's just say that it changes the voltage on the inside and therefore that creates the different frequencies. Now, that is kind of a bare, very bare bones basic without getting too deep into it. Uh, but basically, it is a hotter signal than a dynamic or a ribbon microphone because of that 48 volt phantom power. It is more amplified as it as output. 
The next kind of microphone that we'll talk about is a ribbon. Now, if you could imagine a little ribbon being stretched between two points, any vibration that touches that ribbon, which is very delicate, by the way, is going to be converted into electrical voltage in an output of, um, of a signal in a similar way as a dynamic, but not exactly. So if you talk about the comparisons of all these different microphones, a dynamic microphone is going to be one that is less sensitive. It is one that it takes more to actually move that diaphragm. However, they make great omnidirectional microphones because a vibration can be picked up from any different angle by this little bowl with a, a, a balloon over the surface of it. And so it's going to pick it up fairly well, evenly. Now, that's not to say you can't have other kinds of microphones like a, a cardioid or a super cardioid that is a dynamic also. Those you know dynamics make great microphones because they are more resilient to picking up outside more just you know distracting type echo type sounds so if you were to use a dynamic microphone and your environment is not treated meaning that it is not acoustically dampened and proofed to sound the sound waves are hitting this and bouncing back if your environment is like that then a dynamic will be your friend because it is going to be more resilient to picking up those kinds of frequencies that are bouncing off of hard surfaces. If you have a more treated background, like you have acoustic foam, you have something like this, uh, this insole quilt with an audio mute blanket behind it, if it's absorbing the sound around you a little bit, then a condenser is obviously going to be a great tool for you. They are more sensitive. You can get farther away and still pick up your sound much better. A dynamic you have to be closer to. A dynamic also doesn't pick up nearly the frequency range that a condenser microphone does. But a condenser, on the other hand, is needing, it's a little bit more needy, I guess you could say, with regards to your environment. If your environment picks up more, if you speak and you hear an echo or reverb bouncing off of a table or a wall, the microphone's going to pick it up too, which is one reason why we usually say you should start by treating your background before you go and buy yourself a fancy microphone because a very expensive microphone is just going to pick up everything in your environment even more so because it's a good microphone. It's going to pick up and exaggerate, amplify any bad aspects of your room and recording environment. But a dynamic is going to be more friendly to that. Now, what about a ribbon? A ribbon, because it's just a very little bitty thin thing that's floating down in the air, it picks up vibrations that travel through the air very effectively and very naturally too. So ribbons usually pick up the lows, the mediums, and the high sounds, the low mids and highs, much more naturally. It's a more natural sound. And you can usually get some really good low end bass in your voice when picked up by a ribbon. However, they're not sensitive. Ribbon microphones are more like dynamics in the sense that you don't want to put power to them because a current or a rather voltage uh, being sent from 48 volts phantom power going through the ribbon could damage it. Now, between those three kinds of microphones, there is different ways that they listen to the air around them. And those would be those would be the patterns. Polar patterns comes into play because each capsule will pick up sound in some sort of a fashion around it. For example, an omnidirectional pattern microphone would pick up relatively evenly in all directions around the microphone's diaphragm. Now, granted, even if it is omnidirectional, that's just its ability to pick up those frequencies. It's still going to be more detailed if it's coming down the barrel, just so that's been said. Usually, a microphone that is omnidirectional will start to sound a little bit different when you go completely off axis and behind. Even though it still picks up all the frequencies relatively evenly, it's going to be more detailed when you're going straight in the end of the microphone. Now, if you have a wide cardioid, it is going to be 
not quite omnidirectional. It's going to be pick, picking up more in front of the microphone, maybe a little bit around the sides, but it's primarily focused in the same direction as the microphone. Now, a cardioid is a bit different. If you could imagine cardioid, like cardio, cardiovascular, is heart shape. Now, instead of being a point on the bottom, it's more rounded off. And if the microphone was pointed downwards, then a cardioid pattern would pick up everything kind of in front of it and around it a little bit. But as it comes in on the rear side, it's going to not pick up behind it nearly as well. The reason why I'll explain here in a second, but first let me explain to you binaural or sometimes referred to as a figure eight pattern. If you could imagine the diaphragm, like for example, on a ribbon microphone floating in the air like this, sound will be picked up on one side of that ribbon as it's pushing sound waves in there, that ribbon's going to be bouncing this way. But then sound is also going to be coming in from the opposite direction, causing that ribbon to go in the opposite direction, which is out of phase, meaning that your wave goes through the crest and then through the trough and back to the midline, as we talked about in the first video. But if it comes in from the opposite direction, the out of phase part, it's going to go through the bottom first, then the top. Now, the reason that's important to note is because in phase sound will come into play if you're doing stereotype recordings or if you're doing adding in, for example, an omnidirectional pattern. Because if you take an omnidirectional pattern and you add to that a figure eight pattern over top of it and they're both blended perfectly, you're going to come up with a cardioid pattern microphone. Why is that? Well, because if you can imagine an omnidirectional pattern microphone with two little, two, two little bitty parts on top. One is in phase, one is out of phase. The in phase part is going to pick up more in that direction, but the out of phase part is going to cancel out some of that omnidirectional pattern on the back side. So what you basically gotten is a microphone that has twice the reach out the front and less out the back. That's how a cardioid pattern microphone is made in a sense. Now, how about supercardioid and hypercardioid? Well, by manipulating the amount of positive and negative uh, uh, sensitivity is given to that lobe, I guess you, the, the lobes, I guess you could say, is if you balance it more like, for example, two thirds on the positive and one third on the, the negative end of a binaural pattern, uh, pattern microphone, then what you're essentially getting is more reach out the front and less cancellation out the back, meaning that you're going to start to get a little bit of that omnidirectional pattern off the rear that's not exactly canceled out anymore. You're going to get a little bit of a pattern starting to stick out a little bit there in the end. But you're going to get a lot more reach out the front of the microphone. And depending on the balance that you have of the front and rear positive and negative lobes on that binaural is going to kind of indicate how much of directionality there is, whether it's a hypercardioid or a supercardioid. A hypercardioid is usually more narrow, picks up more in a straighter line. A supercardioid is a little wider than that. So those are basically the basic patterns of them. Now, you might also have heard about shotgun microphones. Now, shotgun microphones is basically a capsule that's inside of what's called an interference tube. If you can imagine a paper towel roll there is no anything to that acoustic in acoustically designed if you were to put that over a diaphragm right but you could imagine hearing what's directly down the end of that paper towel roll from the diaphragm you can imagine picking that up straight down the barrel and you're going to be picking up weird muffle effects from all the other things on the side that's not coming straight down the barrel of that paper towel roll now what a interference tube does is it will block out some of it kind of like that, but it will also have these little slits, slots, vents, whatever you want to call them, kind of arranged in there. Or in the case of like the Rode NTG5, it would have little circles cut into it. And the reason why is because it allows some of the sound from the sides to come in. So that way it sounds more natural than listening through a paper towel roll that's made of metal. And by doing that, it's going to still allow it to sound a little bit more natural while picking up more of what's coming down the barrel. That's the way, in a sense, that a, an interference tube works. 
A couple of other things to consider regarding dynamic condenser and ribbon microphones is that a dynamic microphone is much more rugged. It's more resilient to damage than the other two. For example, a ribbon microphone is simply a ribbon suspended between two points. And if something happens to that ribbon, if it gets dislodged at either end or you put something very loud through it, it's going to stretch that ribbon out, maybe even break it. Drop a ribbon microphone and you're pretty much assuring that that thing is going to be damaged. But a condenser microphone requires power. It has amp amplification built into it. It's got other factors that are going to give it more opportunities for breaking. It's also got an increased frequency response range. It's going to have a lower noise floor. It's, it's got a lot more tech behind it, let's say, than a dynamic, which is just a very simple thing. Some dynamic microphones are extremely cheap, and it's basically just the diaphragm itself going out on a couple of wires. It's, it's basically that simple in some ways, even though those are not very good sounding at all. Now, dynamics, because they're very low sensitivity, but they're very, very rugged, they're ideal for recording gunshots or very loud sounds. Now, you may say I want an increased frequency range. In that case, get yourself a condenser microphone that is designed for higher SPLs or sound pressure levels. The amount of pressure there is in the air going into your microphone, if it's too much, remember the waves of power that, that are vibrations could actually damage a condenser microphone. Now, in similar type fashion, it's also one of those things that it's more re resilient to moisture if moisture is in the air and you have for example what's considered to be an rf bias condenser microphone that means that it's going to be more resilient to moisture than a dc bias microphone now i'm only going to throw those terms out i'm not going to really go into any more in depth regarding them but let's just say that there is different ways that the insides of a condenser microphone are made with regards to res resisting moisture. Dynamic microphones are using more resilient to moisture as well. So you can simply pick it up. Since there's no power going through it, it's very passive. You basically connect the thing up, it's gonna work. Now, a ribbon microphone could be affected by humidity or moisture that actually gets on the ribbon. So you need to be aware of that as well. Now, because of this, you might need to, depending on what you plug your microphones up to, you might need to have some sort of pre-amplification process on a ribbon or a dynamic microphone. Because remember, a condenser is actually amplified by itself. Now, not fully. I mean, it's not loud enough for you to really do anything with by itself. You can't simply plug it directly into your television and expect it to amplify and sound good. Not like you can if it's already gone through a mixer or an interface and it goes out at a line level. The microphone level that a microphone outputs is going to be hotter if it's coming from a condenser or let the truth be known what's called an active dynamic, which is basically a dynamic microphone with built-in amplification. But don't think about that. Those are more rare than, than you'd probably run into at least for a while. Dynamic microphones though, you have to apply more gain. You have to increase the level for you to get a decent level out of it in your audio mixer or your recorder, wherever you are taking that sound in. Now, sometimes the input does not give you enough gain to actually make that sound good while it's still retaining its quiet nature where the background noise is not overly loud. And in that case, you might need to get yourself some sort of a preamplifier or also referred to as an inline amplifier sometimes in order to give it some extra amplification before it gets to wherever it's going, your recorder, your mixer, what have you. So those right there would be using phantom power to basically create amplification for a dynamic or ribbon microphone without passing the phantom power through to the microphone. That's important. Some devices actually do pass the phantom power through, but you don't want that to happen because it could damage your microphone. A dynamic microphone could change tonal qualities. It could also short out in some parts if there's phantom power put through to it. And a ribbon microphone could damage the ribbon. 
so you do not want phantom power on either one of those types of microphones. As we approach the end of Audio Basics number two, I do want to mention a few more things. Diaphragm size does matter. A small diaphragm microphone and a large diaphragm microphone do pick up sounds quite differently. A small diaphragm is considered to be more accurate, which is one of the reasons why usually calibration and measuring microphones are usually small diaphragm. If you could imagine vibrations coming in from different angles on a large diaphragm, it's going to be perhaps creating a wave that that changes the timing of lower frequencies versus higher frequencies. And they don't want that. So a small diaphragm is going to be more accurate. However, a large diaphragm is going to be lower in self noise because if you could imagine a larger diaphragm with the same voltage going across it, the voltage is not going to, it's not going to create anomalies nearly as much as a small diaphragm. Like for example, if a little bitty particle of dust lands on a small diaphragm, it's going to make a bigger self noise type sound than it would on a large diaphragm. It's going to dissipate more. That's just a little analogy that might help you to kind of understand that a little bit. But if you could imagine also a large diaphragm is going to be better at picking up deeper sounds. So you can usually get farther away from a large diaphragm and it's going to be picking up that bass frequency coming from your voice a little bit stronger than a small diaphragm will. Whether or not that's part of what you're wanting to record or not will come into play in your ears and what you want to actually accomplish with your recording. Another factor to consider is the way that your audio is output from the microphone. Is it analog, XLR, or is it digital USB? If it is XLR and you're recording on an analog recorder like a tape deck, then it's fine. Go straight out of the microphone, go straight into the recorder, no problem. But if you're going to record on a computer, the sound has to be converted from analog to digital. And it could be done through a USB audio interface. You could also record on a digital audio recorder and then put that in the computer if you're going to manipulate it. However, it's got to be converted to digital through some sort of an analog digital converter. Now, if you have a USB microphone, it's going to automatically have an ADC built into it. Now, things to consider on that. If the analog digital converter starts to wear differently than the microphone and starts to maybe distort or age or goes bad for some reason, your microphone's dead. You got to get the whole thing fixed because the microphone is married to the analog digital converter. If the connector coming out of the microphone starts to get a little bit noisy and not making a good connection, then you're not going to be able to have a very good output from that microphone anymore. And if you blow the microphone itself, then the ADC is going to be converting over whatever distorted or bad sound it has inputs on the computer. Now, factors to consider there. If you go out via XLR, you can basically convert and do whatever you want to through whatever components you would like to in order to master it digitally. However, with a USB microphone, you can perhaps add in effects that's built into the microphone, but they have to be built into the microphone or interfaced in through software or something like that. You cannot manipulate the sound before it is converted to digital. So there's a few factors to consider. Analog manipulation through perhaps analog audio components, then you can convert it to digital, or you can you also can control lev leveling, limiting, limiting different aspects of your sound, much more so with an XLR analog output than you usually can with a USB. There's advantages and disadvantages. A USB microphone can be plugged in instantly to a computer and it's all a one-stop shop. It's ready to go versus an analog XLR output has to require additional pieces of gear in order for you to get the audio into your computer. So a couple of things to consider there. One last thought. Price does not indicate quality. Just because a microphone is more expensive does not mean it is better than something that is less expensive. So I wanted to leave you with that thought. Thanks for tuning into this second installment of Audio Basics and be sure to tune in the future for more episodes, more explanations, and of course, more sound advice.
Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.